Welcome back, horror fans, cinephiles, and giallo enthusiasts. I am Tanner Leeser, your host of The King in Giallo. In this episode, I will be both reviewing and tallying giallo film cliches for Libido, directed by Ernesto Gastaldi and Vittorio Salerno in 1965. If you are unfamiliar with my giallo film cliche list, I urge you to watch that video first, but it's not necessary. If you are already familiar with my cliches and my counting system, sit back and enjoy. I will be counting cliches before review the movie, and during the review I will be counting the A to Z giallo film cliches I observe, plus staples and signatures from the genre, which come from a list I have compiled over the past decade of my own viewings. As of writing this right now, I predict that libido will not have too many cliches and will likely fall behind in the rankings of cliches observed. But first, a brief overview. Libido premiered in 1965 and is the debut film from Ernesto Gastaldi, who would write some of the best giallo films. This film is also the debut for actor Giancarlo Giannini, who would eventually go on to appear in numerous American films. The film is a black and white proto giallo and is one that I describe as being of the psychological thriller ilk. The film was made as a result of a bet, and thank God for that, because this film remains one of the greatest in the genre, even if it is criminally underseen and underappreciated. But I digress. Spoilers ahead, you've been warned. I'll rush through the previewing cliches. The repeat offenders are 1 point for actor, 3 for writer, 3 for composer, and 5 for director. Luciano Pigozzi was in Blood and Black Lace. 1 point. Ernesto Gastaldi would go on to write some of the best gialli, but this here is his first one written and is his only one directed, so no points just yet. Cliché points for the title, we have one word title. 5 points. First look, we have 25 points for the Italian director, and an additional 15 points for the influence bonus of this being a proto giallo. And would you look at that, it is plot o'clock. The film opens with a title sequence. Again, something which will soon rarely be seen right away in these films as cold opens would become the norm. What's even rarer is this opening text crawl referencing the term libido from Sigmund Freud. The text draws attention to what we define as love and how this can be shaped by experiences an individual lives through in their formative years between birth and adolescence, saying explicitly that childhood traumas can affect one's libido and sexual dynamics. You know, usually a movie of this time might open with a text crawl quoting Shakespeare, but Freud is good too. The movie begins and we are confronted with a cute or creepy Humpty Dumpty looking doll as it spins pirouettes. It tips its hat. What a gentleman. We see a child whose innocent sense of wonderment is interrupted by a woman screaming out in pain. C is for children. Five points. The boy goes upstairs carrying his toy with him. I think this toy is pretty obvious for what it stands for, so let's go right ahead and say it all together now. Symbolism. First person POV, in this case, of a witness or voyeur. Five points. Z is for zoom, and extra points for a zoom on eyes. Ten points. E is for eyeballs, 5 points. V is for voyeur, extra for infidelity, extra for becoming a witness, and extra for being a child, 20 points. W is for witness, 5 points. I don't think a movie has gotten so many points in such a short time. If only there was nudity. Eh, wait till the 70s. We see a woman tied down to a bed screaming out. We receive a title card followed by our credits. This credit sequence is pretty good. The text is overlaid over images burned into our child's memory. Back to the movie. The child's father stumbles, or dare I say lurches, out of the room, exhausted from what he's done inside. The traumatized child peers in and sees the dead woman staring back at him. Add extra points for a zoom on a dead victim, another five points. We transition from boyhood into adulthood with a fading effect. This is our protagonist, Christian, played by Giancarlo Giannini in his debut role. And this is his wife, Hylene. And this is his attorney, Paul, and his wife, Brigitta. Paul was last seen on the channel in Blood and Black Lace as the fashion designer, Cesare. Brigitta is played by Ernesto Gastaldi's wife. And I bet Tarantino likes this movie, just guessing. The four arrive at their destination, the house from the opening sequence. Exposition dumping. Two points. 
we learn that nobody has been living here since the passing of Christian's father, except Paul, who makes trips out here to look after the property. But Regita remarks that something queer is going on. Christian obviously does not want to be here, but he steps out of the car and into the house. Set in a manor or chateau, extra if a group of friends is there for the duration. 10 points. But Regita sits on a cactus. Why do I think this is important enough to point out? I don't know. Why did the movie think this was important enough to put in? Art. Five points. The group walks around the house. Christian fiddles with a grandfather clock. Paul says that they have some repairs to do, but Christian says, why bother? He's selling it. Paul responds that it is still technically Christian's father's house. Paul reminds him of his father's stipulation to inherit the house, the grounds, and the villa, that he must wait until his 25th birthday and prove that he has a sound mind. But until then, Everything is still up to Paul as the administrator of the estate. In three months' time, Christian will be 25, to which he says he will be glad to be rid of Paul. But Paul responds that a lot can happen in three months. Threat? Insult. We learn Paul is at rock bottom. Brigitte finds the, uh, uh, the sex room. Yeah, let's call it the sex room. Brigitte is absolutely thrilled. Christian, not so much. The women apparently don't like each other. I want this pipe. I want this pipe so bad. Hylene tells Christian that she prepared separate rooms, but if he would rather not be alone, that she will join him. We get our first glimpse of Christian asserting rather aggressively that he is not mad. Okay, okay, fine. That first night, Christian enjoys a cigarette and wanders around the house. He goes into Hylene's room and tells her he couldn't sleep while he has another cigarette. He talks to her about what he's feeling and she comforts him. As Christian continues his walk throughout the house, a shadow appears on the wall behind him. He pours a drink, then hears a creaking. The clock chimes. Christian is soon confronted by the stairway from his memories, and he once again ascends the stairs. He comes across the sex room and spies on Brigitta and Paul inside. We get a very extended dance sequence. Very extended dance sequence. Gratuitous 70s dancing. It's the 60s, but it's all the same. Two points. Necking, five points. Christian is visibly disturbed and runs away. I'll go ahead and say O is for obsession, five points. Maybe I've been getting generous with this one in the past, but there's a lot a person can become obsessed with, and so Christian's trauma, I'm counting for this one. I mean, look at him. What the fuck, man? Christian has cut into his own hands. Someone is stalking about the house. Their noise awakens Hylene, who watches the door in anticipation. Close up on a door handle or someone sneaking through in a jar door. Five points. It's the next day and the four are sitting out in the sun. Whoa. Now this is the most subjective cliche, but I'm gonna give it here. F is for fashion, five points. I mean, come on, look at that. In a matter of seconds, Brigitte makes an ass of herself and leaves. No one responds. She tries again, still no. Paul excuses himself too. Christian notices marks on Hylene's neck, similar to the ones he gave himself last night. She says she must have scratched herself in her sleep. Brigitte and Paul are on a cliffside. She asks if this is where Christian's father jumped. And unfortunately, if I don't see the fall to their death, I don't count it, even if I do count deaths in the past, which we don't see. Paul says they never recovered his body, only his torn and bloodied shirt. They talk about Christian. Their conversation seems to imply that whatever is going on, the two of them are not in cahoots together. Paul brings up Christian's doctor, Dr. Berger, who says that nothing is impossible in terms of how this visit may affect Christian. Paul tells Brigitta that he arranged Christian and Hylene meeting, possibly suggesting the two of them are in cahoots. Hylene interrupts them and tells Paul they must discuss inventory. Christian has another cigarette, sees Paul and Hylene walking, then goes for his own walk. He comes across Brigitte sunbathing at the cliffside. She mostly antagonizes him, sort of flirts. He talks to her a little about his past and finishes off by remarking about how he feels a compulsion into the water. He sort of flirts back and tells her if she wants all of this, she could have it. Then he asks what she will do when he finally fires her husband. Hylene and Paul go into a room to take inventory. Hylene rummages about and finds Mr. Humpty Dumpty, but Paul says no, and that Christian was found with that toy when he discovered his father in the dead woman, but we already know that. Christian finds them and looks disturbed. That night, Christian looks for another package of cigarettes while Paul and Hylene play chess. Oh, it's a cricket, is it? 
Christian hears the melody and follows it. In the room, he finds a rocking chair moving on its own, plus the pipe smoldering. Paranormal activity is afoot. Christian is frightened. Hylene leaves the game to check up on him. They rush into the studio, but the chair is still, and the pipe is no longer smoking. He believes someone else must be in the house, but Hylene rejects this. They rejoin the others. The game resumes. Brigitte, likely unfamiliar with the strategy involved in chess, goes to chat up Christian. The conversation devolves to the topic of undergarments. Not sure if they're flirting? Christian becomes disturbed again and talks about his father. He talks about how his perversions and sexual compulsions became worse and worse until he needed to kill. Christian confesses that when he saw Brigitte last night, that something came over him. He springs towards her and she runs away in fear. Later that night, a storm is raging as someone is again stalking through the house. Christian hears the sounds. The POV of the stalker shows them going into a closet and grabbing boots. Christian investigates the sound, then rushes back into the room. The windows are banging and he sees what appears to be his father standing outside in the storm. Christian goes to find Hylene, but she's not there. Oh, wait, no, there she is. He grabs her to show her what he's seen. They run outside and run to the same spot, but nobody is there. They continue back inside and find footsteps ascending a spiral staircase. Spiral staircase, five points. They continue up another staircase. They follow the footsteps and find his father's boots. Christian proclaims it must be Paul in Brigitte, that Paul is upset that his freeloading will be coming to an end soon and that he must want to either kill Christian or at least drive him to insanity so that he won't be able to inherit the estate. Christian reveals that he has a gun. Eileen tells him to put it away. She tries to calm him, to make him see reason. She claims that Paul would never do that because he has been like a father to Christian and also that Paul would technically have to kill her also since she is his legal wife. She sees him to bed. He asks her to stay by his side throughout the night, but when he awakens, she is gone. He goes into the hall, attracted to the sound of the rocking chair. When he enters the room, he finds a man sitting in the chair. It's only Paul. Hylene is there also. She says she woke Paul to tell him about the boots and he was the one who took them. Paul agrees and says he went to check on the car. Christian accuses him of also smoking the pipe earlier and storms out. Alone now, Hylene remarks that she can't take much more, and Paul says that the two of them must act soon. Paul then joins his wife in bed. The next day, Christian and Hylene aren't talking. Paul is heading into town and Hylene asks to join him. When alone, Brigitte remarks how Paul is always talking about Hylene and that this has been the case ever since she's been his secretary. What? Christian says no. He's only met her recently since they got married. Brigitte says no, that they've known each other for ages. Christian looks rightfully suspicious. He takes off to follow them. Reckless driving, five points. Christian finds their car. He waits outside and he waits and he waits. I, uh, dirty Harold, come on and make my day, Jewel. The two come out. He watches them share a kiss and take off. I is for infidelity, five points. Christian, again, is rightfully affected by this betrayal. He drives back to the villa. He finds Brigitte in the sex room. He seems visibly unhinged. He slowly creeps towards her. He reaches out. She begins to go a bit limp. Before anything can happen, Paul storms in, throws Christian off of her, and the two duke it out. Typical 1970s Italian misogyny, woman is saved by a man, 10 points. Paul bitch slaps Christian and only stops when the gun is drawn. He confronts Paul, saying that this is all part of his plan to drive Christian insane and that he even went as far as to marry a woman who looked like his father's victim to guarantee he'd go mad. Hughes for questions, extra if yelled. Ma cosa speravi di ottenere portandomi via Aileen? 10 points. Y is for yelling. Ma ti sei sbagliato ancora? Io non ho provato niente perché non sono come mio padre. 5 points. Hylene tries to intervene, but he tells her to shut up. Typical 1970s Italian misogyny, woman is told to shut up. Two points. Christian begins to confront Hylene and her infidelity, but she says that this is not what happened. A is for alibi. Five points. She says that the two of them went to see his doctor because they were worried that last night Christian came into her room possessed and he hurt her, but this morning he did not remember a thing. She shows him new scars on her face. Christian attempts to put the gun to his head, but Paul wrestles with him, sending a shot into the ceiling. Christian begins having a full breakdown. They see him to bed, where he's acting erratic. The three others are lamenting Christian and their situation of how they may have mishandled things. 
Eileen tells Paul that Dr. Berger will be at the motel tomorrow. The next day, when Paul goes to meet the doctor, the concierge tells him that he's not there. And when Paul calls the doctor's office, he discovers that they received no such phone call yesterday. T is for telephone, five points. Paul rushes back to the villa. Christian awakens and finds a lifeless Hylene next to him. He screams out. Brigitte tries to calm him down. She pushes him into another room and tells him to regain his wits. Paul returns and enters the villa. He cannot find anyone. The mirrored sex room is empty. He hears the tune from the cricket toy. He finds the rocking chair somewhat in motion, but it stops. Behind the chair, he finds the cricket toy. He discovers that the toy, when activated to move, is able to push the rocking chair, realizing that someone had set it there to scare Christian. Odd clue. Five points. Paul finds one of Brigitte's shoes, and finally her transistor radio outside blaring. He looks out over the cliff, calling out to Brigitte. He finds a piece of her clothes. Suddenly, he is pushed off and falls to his death. Someone dies by falling to their death. Fifteen points. His killer is... Brigitte. G is for gloves, extra for black gloves. Ten points. Hidden identity of the killer until the final moments. Five points. Perhaps a stretch here. Christian runs through the house calling out to Brigitte. In the mirrored room, he is stunned into madness by the sight of Hylene's body standing up. Brigitte finds Hylene, and it is revealed that the two of them were in cahoots. Honestly, I did not expect them to be working together. Let's go back now and add L is for lies, five points. S is for secrets, five points. The two discuss what they did and how the events will play out with the police. But when Brigitte learns she won't be getting 50-50, she says that if Hylene dies, then she will inherit everything as Paul's widow. Brigitte says to Hylene that she was killed by Christian, then takes out the gun and shoots her dead. Betrayal by the killer or the accomplice is killed, five points. As Brigitte tidies up, it is revealed that there were two pipes. Might be generous, but evidence seen being destroyed or hidden. Five points. I'll count it because the pipes were hidden. Christian confronts her, now totally insane. He strangles her. Brigitte awakens, tied to the bed, in the same fashion as the woman Christian saw being killed. She screams for him. Extra for why is for yelling. Hysterical woman, add five additional points. She continues to call out to him, pleading for her life, but Christian is far out of earshot, walking along the cliffside, clutching the toy. He is walking with the air of a child. A scream is heard as he throws himself off the cliff to his death. The killer takes his own life, falling. Ten points. The shots of Brigitte flailing on the bed are interesting because they are the actual shots from the opening credits. And even though this is not confirmed as a death, because presumably she could be rescued, I'm going to assume the film's implication is that Brigitte dies here, so the killer is killed by someone. Ten points. Mr. Cricket gives us his one-word review for the film. Fine. And yes, it was. And that's Libido. I rather really enjoy this one. It is a strange giallo insofar that it does something fairly different with the formula. There's no killer stalking about whose identity must be solved. It doesn't totally go in the direction of being a bit paranormal as some might. It is one of those psychological thriller types. The one where you watch the protagonist descend into madness, and the mystery is whether they will overcome it or not. Plus, this movie has the added mystery of who is perpetrating the seemingly paranormal acts in order to push Christian over the edge. It's for these reasons that tallying cliches for this film is rather difficult, and I have to decide what I will allow and where I must draw the line. I'll show you what I mean shortly. Maybe someone can help me out, but I have a minor gripe with how things play out in this movie. Still enjoy it, still love it, but how does this scene actually play out? Sure, one of the women set this up, but how did they switch the pipes in the short time before Christian shows Hylene the room? They are both downstairs. The chair rocking and suddenly not is one thing, but the pipe ceasing its smoldering is something else. I'm sorry. And lastly, who is this supposed to be? Is it really Paul, as stated later, or is this Hylene or Brigitte? It could be one of the two women, but I'll say if it is Hylene, she could be a track star or should be working in Broadway because that is a quick change, as we call it, and a damn fast one. I digress. Where I must draw the line for the cliches in this film include, despite saying that Christian is hallucinating, this doesn't appear to be the case. 
and I'm not gonna count hallucination when what it is is actually gaslighting. No points there. I also don't count the opening as a flashback because it is in chronological order. I don't give you as for undercover for this bit, and this is possibly the most frustrating one for me. I flip-flopped on this for a while, but in the end decided no. I justify it because at first it's hardly being framed as such. I mean, yes, we do see someone's POV arrive at the boots and such, but it's being set up as a possible apparition, and then by the end we don't even know for certain who did it, and if it was indeed Paul, he wasn't actually trying to wear a disguise in order to make Christian mad. This is a really weird one, but I had to take a stance on that. Also, regarding Hylene's alibi, it is the truth in its limited telling, and it doesn't get investigated further, and like I said, she's technically not lying to Christian in this sequence, but in the next one, she lies to Paul, but the bit that is a lie is not part of her alibi. Does that make sense? I also won't give points for supernatural elements because the film never leans in the direction of the events being related to a haunting or a ghost. It is played as if someone tangible is doing them, even when the chair is rocking, Christian thinks it is because of someone in the house. And finally, the lullaby from the toy is not the same thing as an audio recording device being used to lure someone, nor do I count the transistor radio in this bit as such either. Thank you for dealing with me on that. Let's segue to the gialli tally cliches for this movie. Post giallo viewing cliches. The reason for the killings. In this case, the main deception, excluding Christian finally snapping, is greed and gain, five points. The reason for the investigation, Again, in this case, Christian trying to solve what's afoot is a bit tricky. I'm gonna twist obsession due to losing someone to the killer to simply just obsession, 10 points. Maybe I need to expand that one a bit. Extra points for amateur sleuth? Uh, I'm gonna draw a line here again and say no, because when I denote an amateur sleuth, the implication is that the investigation ought to be handled by a professional of the law, and this movie just operates a bit differently. It's not about a killer. Bonus points, the style bonus. The movie is filled with a great assortment of the typical giallo stylistic tropes. We have some crash zooms, both in and out. The opening credits contain this freezing effect and there are numerous POV shots, as well as some use of focus racking. The mirrored room provides an excess of mirror shots during some of the most intense scenes in the movie. The film is also shot in black and white, so we don't obviously have any lush colors or lights, but despite this, the lighting itself is masterfully done. I'll give it 17 points. Soundtrack. This soundtrack is not as giallo-esque as some others. I mean, the soundtrack is actually very fitting for the movie. It does have its moments though, and so, sure, 15 points. Bad effects? Yes, there are two fake bodies falling over the cliff, 15 points. And although the first one is actually pretty good, the second one is laughable. Final look, extra points. The Deadpool telling how many kills and deaths are featured in the film. We have five people seen being killed or dying with one killed in the past. I break it down as thus, 10 points per kill or death scene for the main Deadpool, plus any stylistic kill multipliers, which we already added, plus the knife kill bonus, which this movie does not have any. The first woman. We don't see how she dies. We can assume strangling, but we don't know for certain. 10 points. Paul Benoit falls to his death. 10 points. Hylene Carew shot dead. 10 points. Christian Coru jumps to his death, 10 points. And Brigitte Benoit, who we don't see die, but her inevitable death is strongly implied and thus likely due to starving, 10 points. Extended Deadpool for those other deaths mentioned but not seen, I'll give three points for each. Christian's father, who apparently fell to his death, three points. Red herrings for the total number of legitimate suspects in the film. Five points per legit suspect are awarded. For me, these players are everybody. Granted, Brigitte was the last one I suspected. I never completely ruled her out. I'm torn whether I should include Christian as well, because on one hand, the movie could have unfolded with him being the only person acting out, suggesting a split personality on his part, but the things he sees throughout the film too strongly imply someone else is doing it. Like, if the ending was Christian all along, then the apparition of his father and the rocking chair and the smoking pipe would be kind of bunk. 
I mean, they would be hallucinations. He would have to legitimately be going off the deep end, and in that case, he would actually be hallucinating. So I'm gonna say four characters. Hylene, five points. Paul Benoit, five points. Brigitte Benoit, five points. And Christian's father, five points. You may disagree with me, and that's totally fine, but the movie states a couple of times that his father's body was never recovered. Why he would be faking his death, I don't know, but I absolutely thought for the longest time that he might be involved. I got over halfway through the film before I finally ruled out the father. No flashback sequence as said before, no points, and there is no nudity, so no points there. Ladies and gentlemen, for Libido, I awarded the film an A to Z score of 15 out of 26 cliches. With the bonus points for these, we have a modified score total of 115 points. And for the full Gialli Tally score, I award Libido a Gialli Tally score of 407 points. Compared to The Girl Who Knew Too Much with 452, Blood and Black Lace in second with 422 points, Libido is in third, ahead of the telephone and last with 254. I wasn't sure where Libido would end up. I mean, I did predict for myself it would probably come in third, but I didn't expect it to have so many points, or for that matter, be so difficult to tally. But like I stated earlier, these points don't mean a movie is better or worse. Don't forget the audience submissions. For these film reviews, I will be accepting memes you, the viewer, submit to me created from still shots or GIFs from the movie with some accompanying text. The best ones I will feature in the follow-up video whilst giving you a shout out for your submission. I will also separately be accepting the best still shots from the film inspired by the idea of every frame being a painting. This portion will be called Jello Shots. Submit any of your memes or best film frames for libido to me at IcarusCrispy at gmail.com. Please leave a comment in any of my videos letting me know you've sent a submission. And please like this video, share it with your friends if they are horror fans or cinephiles, or if you want to get them interested in Giallo films. Subscribe to The King in Giallo if you haven't yet. And if you have any questions, thoughts, curiosities, or concerns, leave those below in the comments section and I will get back to you. Give The King in Giallo a follow on Instagram and a like on Facebook. Next time on The King in Giallo will be The Possessed. I'm actually not sure if I'm going to do an overview first and then the review in Jelly Tally. Either there will be an overview or there will be an overview, review, and Jelly Tally in one video. Thank you all very much for your continued support. This is Tanner Leeser for The King in Giallo. And if nothing else, I'll see you next time.